I, I want to start things off this morning uh, actually with a contest. Person. Those of you who know me well know that I like things that have winners and losers. So I have one of those for us today. Uh, here's how it's going to work. My friend Bakanzi, who has showed up early and is using his gifts to serve our community, thank Bakanzi for showing up early. Bakanzi is running slides for us today, and in a few seconds, not yet, he's going to put an image up on the screen. It's going to be the first image of uh, Bakanzi on the, the screen there. And uh, your job as people who see this image is to identify as quickly as possible who the creator of this image is, who the person is that's responsible for the creation of this image. Now, some of you have already seen it. If you've been at the screen, you guys can't be a part of this. I'm sorry. Uh, you lose out. But there's an actual prize. There's something at stake here. If you correctly guess and blurt it out, the first person I hear to correctly guess and blurt out the creator of this image will get a free coffee or tea from me and a free snack to go along with that, if it's a scone or a donut or a sandwich. And I will also offer my presence to hang out and get coffee, but you may not like me that much, and that's okay. So if it's just me getting you a drink and a snack, great. Uh, you guys understand how the game's going to work? Okay, there's going to be a lot of people yelling, and I'm listening for the right answer here. I'm the one who judges who gets it right. So uh, I'm going to get out of the way so everybody can see. I think I heard Tim, Tim Martinovich. Nice. Martinovich, well done. He, yeah, I mean, Lori said God, which I guess in a, in a long distance way, that's true, right? He created Michelangelo, which then created, but he also is the creator, so that's pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, Tim, we'll find a time to get you your prize. Well done. Uh, this painting is by a guy named Michelangelo. Uh, the title of that painting in particular. Oh, it's the creation of Adam, which Adam means man in Hebrew. So, yeah, the creation of Adam. Well done. Uh, what, and most of us know that. It's a, a pretty famous relic in, uh, in Western art history. Uh, many of you have probably seen it. Even if you didn't know it was painted by Michelangelo or know the title of it. But what many people don't know is that that piece of art is actually part of a much bigger canvas. That is not its own uh, complete piece. It's actually a small fragment of a much larger whole. I've got the whole up here in the next image because you want to throw that one up. The creation of Adam, you may not be able to see it. It's like the second spot down from the very top of the screen there. It is a tiny fragment in a much larger story. And while that fragment is beautiful and, and awesome, uh, it strikes you with, with its beauty on its own, the real beauty of this painting is seen in the whole. You're filled with wonder when you walk into the Sistine Chapel. I haven't had the privilege to do it myself, but that picture alone shows you how striking this work of art is. And I think sometimes in the church, we have a tendency to examine the Christian life sort of like we think of the creation of Adam, as this one kind of narrow, tunnel vision focused, individual piece of art. And the reality is that that has implications for us in our Christian lives. It, it makes us say, we know the Christian life is just really about saying a prayer and getting baptized. That's, that's what the Christian life is about. And to be clear, those are crucial, beautiful, important parts of the Christian life, but that is 10 yards of a 100-yard field that Jesus has called us into as Christians. He has in mind holistic transformation for us as his followers. And that's one of the, the main reasons why we're starting this new sermon series in the Spring of Town. We're calling it Christian Atheism, which is a little racy title. Right? <laughs> it sounds a little contradictory. Uh, but the hope in this series is that we don't want to be the sorts of people who get saved, who say a prayer, who get baptized, and then proceed to live the same sorts of lives that we lived before. We don't want to be the sorts of people who, if you stacked us up next to an atheist, you wouldn't notice anything different. We have a tendency sometimes in the church to separate belief from action, that believing in Christ means assenting to certain ideas. But the reality is, nowhere in the Bible is belief separated from action. Belief leads to action. They're directly connected. And Jesus is calling us to a transformed life in every part of our day to day. And so we want to take the next few weeks of Lent, uh, the period leading up towards Easter, thinking about this sort of transformative life that Jesus has called us to, this holistic Christian life. We're going to do that by looking at his most famous sermon. So turn with me in a Bible if you've got one, if you've got an app that works as well. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading from verses 13 through 16 for us. So you can follow along. Matthew 5, 
13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I mentioned, this is one of Jesus' most famous sermons in Scripture. His most famous. Uh, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. But the reality is we're jumping into the sermon actually a little bit after the beginning. And again, I, I don't want to be the sort of person who just looks narrowly at the creation of Adam, right? I don't want to just focus in on one text when the reality is there's a much bigger canvas Jesus is painting. So I want to take a couple steps back uh, and think about what Jesus is doing in this sermon broadly. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to have to travel back in time to before uh, Jesus was around on planet Earth. A few hundred years before he started preaching this sermon, there was a poem written. It's actually something you can find in your Bibles now. It's in Isaiah chapter 61. And this poem follows the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the ancient empire of Babylon. Now those are some ancient city names that don't have as much meaning for us as 21st century Americans, but to the people this poem was written to, it was crucial. See, the people who believed in the Jewish scriptures, they understood that God, when he was going to come and restore the earth and bring healing and justice and peace to the earth, that he was going to do that through the city of Jerusalem, through the Jewish people. And so if the, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, well, did that mean God had abandoned the people? Did that mean that there was no hope for this eventual restoration and justice and peace? The people were looking at the rubble of their city and saying, where's God? And this poem in Isaiah responds to this sort of despair that the people have. And the poet speaks of a messenger, one who brings good news. News that God has not deserted people. That God will return and bring justice for the oppressed. That he'll return and bring freedom for the captives. That he'll return and bring healing for the brokenhearted. And so naturally, this was a prophetic poem that, that these folks believed heartily in that they placed their hope in, that God was going to be who God said he was. So now let's fast forward again to our good Middle Eastern friend named Jesus giving his sermon in Matthew 5. In verses 1 through 12, he starts this sermon, just before the salt and the light passage that we get to today. And guess what Jesus starts his sermon with? That poem. He references back to this poem and combines it with a few other ancient Hebrew poems. He connects all of these dots for the people who are listening to him, and they know precisely what he's doing here. Hmm. See, in that time, when stories were given to people, a, a text, writing it down, was a little more difficult. So many people told stories and poetry to one another. They had really good memories, and they could remember these things from their childhood all the way into their adulthood. They knew what Jesus was referencing in these first 12 verses of Matthew 5. Jesus is saying in this moment that the good news of God's restoration and justice and peace has arrived in him. He is the one that the author of Isaiah 61 was talking about. He's the king who has come to bring justice for the oppressed, freedom for the captives, and healing for the brokenhearted. That's the good news. And Jesus uses a phrase to describe how this good news arrives in the world. He calls it the kingdom of heaven. And he uses that all over this sermon, but then also in the rest of his ministry. And he's saying that the good news means that the kingdom of heaven is here and can be experienced and participated in now, and that it is ruling for eternity. That the rulers of this earth no longer have say over things, that Jesus is now king. And so before we even get to the salt and light images in this passage, Jesus is showing us here that the kingdom is a reversal of anything else we've experienced in the world. He's saying in verses 1 through 12 that you don't have to be of royal blood to be in this kingdom. Nor do you have to have a certain amount of, of time or claim a certain amount of right to be a part of it. Jesus starts his sermon not by saying anything that you need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven. He starts his sermon by saying what the kingdom of heaven has brought to you. 
In verses 1 through 12, which we call the Beatitudes, Jesus says that the kingdom comes near to those who are the most troubled, who are the most downtrodden, the most oppressed, the most broken in the world. And through those people, he brings peace and restoration and justice and healing. The kingdom of heaven is not good news for the best and brightest. It's not good news for society's most righteous and powerful and elite. It's good news for those who are most aware of their need for saving. It's good news for those who are most aware of their brokenness and the brokenness of the world around them. And something starts to happen in us when we hear about this kingdom. Our ears and hearts start to open to something that we've kept deeply hidden and chosen not to identify in our lives, but we know is true. We're the ones that are troubled and downtrodden and oppressed and broken. We're the ones who mourn the lives of those we've lost this year, to violence, to a disease, or otherwise. We're the ones who are poor in spirit, mired in our own doubt and despair. We're the ones desperately in need of fulfillment, of peace, of love. And Jesus is telling us a foundational, essential truth of his present and coming kingdom. It's for the needy and the broken, which means it's for every one of us. That's why it's called good news, you guys. God has graciously come to give us freedom from the things that bind us now, and he simply calls us to receive his grace by turning and following him. And with that news, something starts to click in us. Our icy hearts, which have been made cold by the trials and troubles of the world, they start to be strangely warmed. Our souls illuminate as if awakening from a cavernous slumber. Our eyes blink open to the cosmic canvas. We become transformed by the good news of this eternal artist. That's the canvas that Jesus is painting on here. It's not just one little painting in verses 13 through 16. It is a massive, expansive canvas that started at the beginning of time and is going to culminate at the end of time. That's where Jesus is painting here. But he doesn't put down his brush with the big picture. He also starts to talk about, in verses 13 through 16, what it means to be a part of this kingdom of God, what it means to participate in it, what this kingdom of God looks like to the world around. And that's where he gives us those two famous images, salt and light. So we'll look at both of those in turn. First, he says that we are the salt of the earth, in verse 13. Now, in the ancient world, there were three main purposes that most people understood salt to have. Three main purposes that salt served in their regular lives. The first purpose was that salt was used to heal. Salt was combined with water and washed over wounds and helped pull the bacteria out from those wounds. In other words, those who say they're a part of this kingdom, those who are the salt of the earth, they're the people who help heal a wounded world. And they do this precisely because they've been wounded and they know what it means to be healed. They do it because they're the people who are mentioned in verses 1 through 12. They're the people who have experienced the love of Jesus, have understood the transformation that he's done in their lives, and they go out in the world and want everyone to feel the same thing. And so this is a reminder to each of us in this room that those of us who call ourselves Christians are never healed purely for our own sake. None of us have been healed so that we can punch our ticket to heaven. We've been healed so that we can go and heal the world. Christianity is not about believing a set of ideas for the world's sake. It's about becoming certain types of people for the world's sake. Christianity is not about believing a set of ideas for our own sake. It's about becoming certain types of people for the world's sake. And if you've been transformed by Jesus and his work, it's going to prompt in, an, in you a desire to see the whole world transformed as well. That's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. So that's the first purpose that his audience would have understood that salt had. It was used to heal. Second purpose was that it was used as a preservative Salt would be added to, to perishable food, particularly meat, and uh, slow the decaying process. And so in this kind of usage, we understand that Christians are supposed to be a preservative force in the world. They're supposed to maintain what is fresh and keep things from getting too sour. And it's interesting, salt is able to do this because it is fundamentally different on a cellular level than the food that it's added to. 
See, bacteria needs water in order to thrive. And salt, the ions, the sodium and chloride ions, soak up that water. That's why when you have something salty, you feel like you need a drink. It soaks up the moisture. And it keeps bacteria from thriving. It only happens because the fundamental makeup of salt <coughs> is different from the decaying food that it's added to. Which means that if the church is going to heal the world, if it's going to preserve the world, it has to be different than the world. It has to live by fundamentally different rules than the world around it. And if the church doesn't do that, if the church becomes like the world, and if it lives by their rules, then it won't stop decay. It's actually going to exacerbate decay. It will contribute to the decay that's already happening. And so that should make each of us ask a convicting question of ourselves as people who are part of this salty kingdom. Are we living like the salt that we are or like the decaying world around us? Do we live from a spirit of generosity? Or are we focused on obtaining and protecting ourselves and our tribe? Do we seek to make peace and love our enemies, or do we add gasoline to a divisive fire? Do we live as meek and humble followers of the king who made himself a servant, or do we long to obtain important seats of power in the world? Are we perpetuating the assumptions of this broken, world, or are we working to bring life contrary to those assumptions? And it's often because the church fails to live differently than the world that the world says, nah. Because they look at the church, and all they see is a mirror reflecting themselves back at them. And it's got a little gold religious plating, but there's nothing different about those people. To heal and preserve the world, we need to be people who are different, expressing this remarkable and reversing kingdom to a world in desperate need of it. So that's the second purpose of salt. It's heal and preserve. And the third purpose his audience would have understood. It's one that actually connects to us. It was used to flavor things. Salt is often added to things to bring out the good flavors that are already there. And sometimes even add its own flavor. Last week was, was Valentine's Day. Uh, and I'm married, so I have to celebrate this obligatory holiday. Uh, uh. <laughs> my power is much greater than me. But I, I do love my wife. We went on a date, and uh, we went to the Cheesecake Factory. Her, my in-laws gifted us a, a sweet gift card. If you haven't been to the Cheesecake Factory, the menu is a book. It is expansive. <laughs> so we're flipping through. We're like, what are we going to get? We had a gift card, so we're like, you know what? Let's get it all. We can get it in a box and go. So we had lunch for the next couple of days as well. Uh, I didn't intend that to be an ad for Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> <laughs> but we're there. I ordered uh, one of my favorite sides and snacks to order is uh, sweet potato fries. One of my favorite <laughs> And they bring out their sweet potato fries, yeah. and immediately, amen, I hear the name. <laughs> nice, all right. Stephen, we'll go get some sweet potato fries. Um, yeah, so they bring out the dish, and these sweet potato fries were some of the best I've ever had because they were covered in salt. And not, not the little salt, but the thick salt, right? The big salt. And the flavors were just brought out of it. And it made the flavors better. And I have to confess to each of you, I was selfish and was smuggling the salty ones to my side of the dish to keep them for my wife. So I have to confess, I've not been as sacrificial as I ought to be because Jesus would want me to be. No. But they were so good. The salty fries, they tasted so much better. Salt is meant to be added to things to make them taste better. You don't put salt in a salt shaker to leave it there as decoration. Although there are some cool salt shakers these days. You, you use the salt shaker to add it to everything. This means that while the church is supposed to be different than the world and live by fundamentally different rules, they're not supposed to be separate from the world. They're not supposed to be apart from the world, from all those heathens out there, right? That's not the church's job. The church's job is to be added to the world, to enhance and contribute to it. We're different from the world, but we're not separate from it. Now, there's a, a famous letter uh, that archaeologists have discovered uh, it was likely written and dated in the early church, the first few centuries of the church. And, and we don't know exactly who wrote it, but this person describing uh, the Christian church, it's a pretty fascinating work for us. And I think it's a reminder of what it means to be flavorful in the world. Uh, it's a long letter, but I want to I want to share it with you guys. So it comes in, we've got a slide with the letter up there. I'll read it off the screen. There it is. Oh, next one. Nice. Right. There it is. Christians are distinguished from others, neither by country nor language, 
Nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines. Following the customs of the natives in respect to their clothing and food and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. They marry, as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. Next slide. They're in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all people and are persecuted by all. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulted and repay the insults with honor. The church, when it lives its calling to be flavor in the world, it makes the world more palatable and enjoyable by its presence. So those are three purposes that Jesus' audience would have understood salt to have. That it heals, it preserves, and it flavors. And what's interesting about those three purposes, you may have noticed it, they're all projected outward. They're all uh, kind of implying that salt needs to be added to things, right? That it goes to things. You don't add salt to salt, right? But in recent years, in recent decades, the church, broadly, particularly in the United States, has tended to focus itself a lot of its time in Britain. It cares more about the perpetuation of its own thing rather than the health of the world. And so churches often have budgets that emphasize the best sound systems and fog machines for their Sunday morning performances. Right? Mm -hmm. Christians have found a way in the last few decades to create an entire media and arts industry purely for themselves. Christian movies, Christian music, we've created those things for ourselves. And those things aren't intrinsically bad in and of themselves, but it's interesting that oftentimes the church focuses on those inward things rather than the way that the salt needs to be focused outward. If salt isn't obeying these outward ideas, then it's failing to be salt. And Jesus says, well, it's worth being thrown out entirely when that becomes true. There's a, a pastor that's written a, a few books and, and has spoken largely on what it means to be salt in the world. His name is Tony Campolo. Some of you may know or have heard of him. He's been a spiritual advisor for presidents in the past. He's a pretty noteworthy uh, thinker and, and pastor when it comes to this Christian life. And uh, he was teaching a few years back, and he tells a story of a Jewish student that he had in his class. And he asked this Jewish student, hey, would you mind going to this evangelical church that was close uh, to, to where he taught? Would you mind going and just tell me what you think of it? Like, what do you perceive that they're about when you go? I'm not trying to coerce you to become a Christian. I just kind of want to see what your thoughts are. And so this Jewish student was like, sure, I'll go. So he shows up, he goes to church on that Sunday morning, and he comes back to Tony. And Tony says, what did you think? What was the church like? And his words were fascinating. He said, it's as if the people at this church read the Beatitudes, the first 12 verses of Matthew 5 here, the start of Jesus' sermon. It's as if they read those statements and then formed a committee to do precisely the opposite. <laughs> it's as if they formed a committee to elevate the people who are powerful and elite in culture. It's as if they formed a committee to make all of the impressive people elevated and make everyone else feel less impressive. Or, if you were going to show up, you had to look impressive. You had to be impressive. Keeping our saltiness means living as Jesus did and doing what Jesus says salt does here. And that means... We're not supposed to just elevate the self-righteous and the successful in the world, but instead give ourselves to heal, preserve, and flavor the world around us. A world that's full of broken and needy people, just like us. So that's what it means to be salt of the earth here, as people who are part of this kingdom of God. But he continues. Uh, Jesus says, a second, uh, gives us a second image, uh, to be light to the world. And that phrase should stick out to those of us who've been reading our Bibles for a little while. Uh, it should sound like what Jesus says about himself. Right? In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So there's clearly a connection between Jesus and the church. He's drawing that connection here. Jesus is saying that when the world sees the church, they should see Jesus. 
When the world sees our light, they should see the eternal light. There's a few important implications to this idea of being light of the world. First, notice here that Jesus says, you are the light of the world. That's a status given to us by Jesus. It's not something that he tells us to earn. He doesn't say, you've got to go try to be the light of the world, or you've got to earn your status as the light of the world. It's not a Christian life that we level up to. It's a gift that Jesus gives us. He encourages us to use that gift that we've been given in his spirit and then to re-gift it to the world. This is a status given to us by Jesus. And secondly, when we start to do this, when we start uh, this kingdom work for Jesus that he's called us to and for the needy in our world, it's not intended to make us look good. The goal of being light to the world is not to make the church look impressive. The church is a reflection of the heavenly light. It's not the light itself. It's the moon to Jesus' sun. You guys know that the moon does not emit light on its own. Anytime that you see the moon in the sky, that is a reflection of the sun's light off of the moon. We are the moon to the sun of God. We're the ones who, when the world looks at us, should think there's something unique about those people. They're reflecting something beyond themselves. It's not about their remarkability. It's about the remarkability of their God. I mean, look at the people who follow Jesus. Look at the 12 he called. The 12 disciples might as well be called the 12 unremarkables. They were day laborers. They were despised tax collectors. They were small business owners, service industry workers. Even beyond his disciples, prostitutes followed him. And yet those people changed the world precisely in their unremarkability. Because people would look at them and say, I know your status. I know who you are. I know you smell like fish because that's what you do all day. I know what you do in the dark of night, woman, and you have done something different with your life now. You're being transformed. There's something happening in you that no worldly structure can, uh, can explain. There's something powerful going on in these Christian people. There's some light that's not just them. It's greater. Friends, your job is not to hold a superior moral standard, to look impressive to the world so that they come to your social club on Sunday or Wednesday. Your job is to reflect the grace and love of Christ, which you have experienced in your life, and then proclaim that grace and love through your lives. God didn't redeem us and make us light to hide us under a basket. He didn't do that and then hold us to the side until the day after the world ends. He came so that the world would see the light in the church and would know Jesus because of it. And I feel like it's, it's helpful for me and necessary for me uh, to come clean with you guys. I've done a lot of critiquing of the church, some of the deficiencies that I've seen in the church here. But genuinely, I don't do that out of a sense of self-righteousness myself. I don't do that saying, you all need to get better. That's not what I'm doing here. Because the deficiencies I've identified are my deficiencies. They're the same things that I struggle with. I want to look impressive to everyone. I want the world to look at me and think, Clint, he's got his stuff together. Right? I'm tempted by that often. I often overlook the needy because I'm so focused on my stuff. I often jump to condemnation before love. It's tempting for me to become a Christian atheist, to have belief that I speak up here and to not actually change my life. But the more that I read the words of Jesus, the more I realize, if I'm gonna do that, if I'm gonna make this split between my beliefs and my actions, then I have to stop reading Jesus. Because he makes no such split. And the reason I'm in this is because of Jesus. That's the whole point of this thing. There's something fascinating about this Palestinian rabbi from a couple thousand years ago that keeps me coming back always. And so I read these words and I say, we should be these. We should do these things. It's so much more than just a few statements we affirm. It's so much more than a social practice we pursue. It's the daily embodiment of an otherworldly kingdom. It's salt water to clean the open wounds of the world. It's preservative to keep the world from complete and utter decay. It's the flavor of real, peace-filled life. 
It is light in a world full of darkness. Light in a world longing to escape its abyss. We aren't gifted this sort of beautiful, peaceful life just for our own sake. We're gifted this so that it can restore every creature in the cosmos. We point people to Jesus in the kingdom, friends, by living differently than the world, but not separate from it. We go into the world. So let's stay salty. <laughs> Let's be lit. <laughs> let's live transformed because we are. And let's show the world what Jesus and his kingdom really look like. Would you pray for me?